Uh, Dennis Augustine, I've been in uh, software right now for 24 years, a few decades, and um, the time has flown. I've been doing Sitecore for the last 14. Uh, I've been um, two, doing two Sitecore focused practices uh, in my career as an entrepreneur as well. Uh, I'm currently at Konobos, which is uh, you know my, my third business partnering with uh, the legendary Akshay Sura and, and Kamru's Jamin or Jammy Kami um, over at Kona Bose and the rest of the team there. So we're, I've been in Sitecore for a while. I'm a six time Sitecore MVP and also um, with Megan, uh, and Megan and uh, Jaina helped to organize the, to, uh, the strategy lunch. And I hope you would join us there at some point in the future as well. Okay. Today, I'm here to talk about composability from an architect's, from a strategy perspective, from a CX architect's perspective, and that's what I do um, at Conobos. I do business development and sales, but also CX architecture when I work on projects, um, business development, sales, CX architecture is my role over at Conobos. We've been hearing a lot about composability lately in the Sitecore space because of the acquisitions that Sitecore has made over the last few years. And of course, Sitecore has been rebranding itself and its positioning as a composable DXP company. But what does that mean for all of us who have been like me in the Sitecore space for a while? And how will your life change? And how do you explain composability to, to users, to uh, customers, and to stakeholders who aren't technical? That's what we're going to focus on today. And so I'm going to take a step back and let's just have a look at what the word composability means in, it, in and of itself. And on the screen now, we have a definition by Wikipedia, the source of all truth. Composability is a system design principle that deals with the interrelationships of components. A highly composable system provides components that are selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy specific user requirements. So, it is taking various components and putting them together in a system. And I will tell you that system does not necessarily mean software system, by the way. If we're talking about composability, it's a concept that can apply to things well beyond software. So composability is any system that is put together from various components and it deals with their relationships uh, between those components to uh, satisfy a particular requirement or business need or any sort of other need. That's what composability is. Now, I got into the software space because I like to take apart things as a kid. I was always disassembling stuff, putting them back together, trying to figure out how they work. And one of my favorite toys when I was a young boy that I ever got one Christmas was a construction set. It was basically panels and sticks and things that you could use to create any number of types of um, office towers and buildings and things like that. So it could be taken apart and recombined to, to build various things. And I think that that sort of play and interest in how things worked and modularity and those sort of principles about how we create complex structures from the ground up was what really led me to have an affinity for software. And so I spent the first part of my career as a software developer and then software architect. As a matter of fact, my first Sitecore MVP was in technology. I'm not even allowed to touch code unless I'm playing with some experiment now because I have people at Conobos who are so much better at that than I. But I still think about systems from a software perspective. And of course, it's a well-known concept in software, composability. What is a composable software system? It's built from modules. It's built from modules that have a particular sort of responsibility and really great solid principle-led architecture is something where those modules have a single area of responsibility. You have a module that does one thing, uh, ideally, so that you can know what that module does very succinctly and that you can then change that module out for something that does the similar role. Of course, if you're changing things out, 
for things that do have that similar role, you need to make sure that they are interchangeable and that they can be connected to each other. Oftentimes they're connected by various interfaces, interfaces that allow the uh, consumer and producer of those uh, actions to be able to have a contract between them so that they can interop, uh, they can be interoperable. And why do we do that in software? We do that in software so that we can have a little bit more loosely coupled systems so that when we want to change the order processing bit of our solution, we don't have to rip out and change everything else because we've got all of this spaghetti code sort of monolithic uh, code that is impossible to, to pull apart. So composability in software, modularity in software leads, yields much more highly flexible systems. And every software developer who's, or architect who's worth their salt will be creating complex systems in a composable way because that's how you future-proof those systems. And that's how you don't rip out your hair when somebody asks you for a change to one of the pieces of the functionality of that system. So that's composability in software. But we're not talking about composability from a software or technical perspective today, we're gonna to look at it from a different perspective. We're gonna look at composability from a business perspective. And I wanna to submit to you that businesses, no matter of fact, whether it's businesses or relationships, families, uh, societies, they are all systems. And you can think of them as systems. A matter of fact, you can think about your brain as a system with various regions that have particular areas of responsibility and communicate with other things. So systems thinking is something that works with almost any complex structure. If you really want to be able to understand how the world works, start to think about it in terms of how do the various systems interact with each other? And what are the reasons for the behaviors that I'm seeing if you really want to understand those things? And so i because of my software background, when I got into entrepreneurship and putting teams together and working a business, I naturally gravitated towards thinking of businesses as a as systems and thinking about my team as uh, and departments as components in those systems. So what does composable ability mean in terms of business when you, when we think about business as a system? Well, departments, those are analogous to things. And we'll talk about packaged business capabilities a little bit later on. A packaged business capabilities, packaged business capabilities are the things that Gartner was talking about in 2019 when they started talking about composable business, saying that you needed to have certain capabilities in your business, think modules, capabilities in your business that do specific things. So departments like accounting, marketing, you know, IT, human resources. They have certain roles. They are made up of people rather than lines of code, but they're grouped into modules that have certain roles and functions in the business. And they are made interoperable with each other because they have interfaces that are the rules, the processes that connect one thing to the other. When I go and I do a quote, I need to make sure that I involve PMO and there's an interface between me and the project office to make sure that that quote involves enough time for the project manager and somebody vets the estimates. And we have processes and rules that make that bidding process work a little bit. And I have a handoff between myself and them. So there's an interface between myself and PMO or perhaps legal uh, or marketing or any number of people who would be involved in those processes. If you just would one, one second. Sorry, I'm just going to just pause for, for one moment. Thank you, sorry, but that's wanted to, now that I don't have an office, my wife is doing certain things, is making noise and I had to kind of pause that. So my apologies to, to her and to you for the, for the break. But what I was talking about interoperability, when we're talking about business and thinking about it as a system, we are, the processes are your interfaces between your various business units as well. So think about business as a system and think about composability 
in that context. As I mentioned, so when Gartner started talking about composability, this was way back in 2019, they brought up that, that the future of business is composable. They were not talking about technology. Now we've adopted composable DXP and there's been a lot of talk in our space about composability and its benefits from a technical perspective, but that's not where this conversation started. It started when Gartner was talking about composability in the business context. And there are certain principles that make a business truly composable. They are modularity, autonomy, orchestration, and discovery, according to Gartner. What do those things mean? Modularity, it is really to be able to have, as I mentioned, departments, modules, functions that are dealing with these single areas, and so that they can be interchangeable with each other. That yields greater agility. Uh, in, in the business uh, and in the way that teams can work together. If I can plug in, you know, if I have several QA teams and they all do the same sort of a function and I need to plug in this QA team or this QA person into another team, if I know that they have, they do essentially the same thing, I'm able to be more agile in how I organize my teams. Well, that still applies with business when I scale that up, especially to the large enterprise. Autonomy. That means that the various business units have the ability, the right, the authority to be able to run their own operations. You know, somebody from legal is not going to tell accounting how to do their job. So the autonomy of the various units is very important to have a more flexible and agile business. If I have to check with everybody before I can do my job, I'm not going to have a very agile way of doing work. So autonomy is a very important aspect of having a composable, flexible, agile business. And we'll get to why this matters in our digital experience space in a little while as well. Orchestration, again, this is managing the communications, the orchestration between elements. So um, matching those business functions uh, and responding to change. Think about your brain. Uh, when you have your visual centers, they need to be able to talk rapidly to the to the centers that you know, interpret what those things are about, to your language and so forth. So all the parts of your brain need to be orchestrated in order for you to be able to function in society. The same thing is true with regards to all the aspects of our business. They need to be able to function and orchestrate rapidly in order for us to have a very nimble, agile business. And discovery. We need to be able to tell each other what's happening in a quick and rapid way so that we can respond rapidly to change. So these are important principles if we want to have a very flexible, rapid and agile business in the future. And, you know, honestly, this is something that is really becoming so much more important as the pace of change starts to increase. So we see that, saw that over COVID and there'll be another slide. I'll speak a little bit to that later. The building blocks for a composable business are the three, flexible thinking, business architecture and composable technologies. There is no right way to approach any problem. And I want to say that again, there's not just one solution. I've often been in rooms where people say, we should do that this, it this way, this is the right way. And I want to say that when we have a composable thinking in our business, we understand that the right way today or in this situation might not be the right way tomorrow, or when the situation changes. So we want to be agile and flexible in our thinking about our solutioning. And that yields to agility and flexibility being necessary in the way that we organize our business. And then that leads to us needing to implement technologies that support us being agile and flexible. That is why when we talk about composable technologies and composable DXPs, we start talking about things like SaaS and the direction that Sitecore is going right now, the future of Sitecore is SaaS, why? Because if I want to be able to pivot and to change out a piece of my, of my stack, if I want to be able to implement a new feature, I don't have to go and do the infrastructure and all of the other stuff and all of the plumbing to be able to facilitate that. Uh, so composability and SaaS often are going hand in hand. The technologies themselves need to be able to be rapidly deployed, rapidly switched out in you know, order to be able to support the uh, business architecture and the thinking and the rapid response that's necessary for 
being a composable business. So you'll see that it was the thinking first and then the architecture. And then lastly, the platform that was, that was kind of called out as the building blocks. We wanna go from the, from the top down in, our, in the way that we orient our thinking there, not from the bottom up. So on that bottom scale, we talk about business technologies. How, do, how does the technology aspect come into this place? So we are DXP uh, professionals working with the Sitecore platform. So what does a com truly composable business technology look like? Well, it's one, first of all, where that is centered around the packaged business. So the packaged business capabilities, the uh, PBCs, that align with what the business is doing. So the technology itself needs to really be focused on a particular business capability. Um, business capabilities are things that sometimes have cross-cutting concerns between departments, by the way. So it might just be that you have accounting and you have marketing and you have sales and you have maybe customer service and so forth. But across all of those, perhaps you're doing content management. Well, that's a business capability that is a nice and neat package that you can orient your technology around. So if I want to have a very flexible business, perhaps I want to have best of breed in terms of the just the content piece that I do. What else do we have in terms of package business capabilities that relate to technology? Things like analytics, whether I'm in sales or an executive suite or in marketing, I will need to use best of breed analytics. And so analytical tools might be cross-cutting concerns. All of a sudden you start to see that these packaged business capabilities aren't just to do with marketing. And that's been our usual, by the way, in the site core space, it's been our usual audience has been marketing and IT. But perhaps some of those cap business capabilities are things that can be leveraged right across the business if we focus on the PBCs. Um, I was on a um, a SMAC, uh, the Sitecore uh, Strategy MVP Advisory Council um, webinars that they do. We were talking, I was talking with Ken Gray about Content Hub. We had one customer who initially was looking at Sitecore Content Hub for their marketing department. And when we went into Discover, we found that, hey, there was content crisis throughout their organization. It wasn't just a marketing problem. We talked to other stakeholders and we found, well, you know what? The people in human resources and training and in sales and in customer service who were preparing webinars and seminars for some of their uh, member base could also use Content Hub. So all of a sudden, I released when we released ourselves from that sort of a thinking, we saw that this package business capability of content management, orchestration, and so forth was something that was applicable right across, right across the business. So uh, centered around specific capabilities is very important. The technologies themselves should be loosely coupled. So our old approach in the Sitecore world, the approach of XP and XM that we came from is one where everything was all in the single monolith, all very tightly coupled together. Sure, from an architectural perspective, we can look at different namespaces and so forth and know that you know the pipeline stuff does this and the other bit does that. But it was all very tightly coupled ultimately. Um, these are usually API first. Why? Because it allows us to do rapid integration. They, it is focused, much aligned with the P, uh, PBC uh, conversation on single areas and very much aligned with the SaaS thing that I talked to you about. It's easy to implement and easy to pivot when we have a, uh, a really composable technology. So think about it this way, the old way that we had with the monolithic XP, not so composable. Certainly, it looks like a lot of the tools that we'll be getting with Sitecore's new suite could be more closely aligned with this. I'm looking forward to see how, uh, how it plays out in practice later on this year. How are we doing for, for time, Bala? Just wanted to let you get just check in on that. No, we are going good. Uh, Very good. Yes. Yep. I have the one screen now, so I'm not getting any, any uh, timers or anything else as well. So. Why composability? And I will need to minimize you so I can read out this whole quote since I don't have any, any notes in front of me. Gartner said this again, this was some years ago. By 2020, they said this in 2019. 
And by 2023, that's next year, that's just any minute now, organizations that have adopted an intelligent composable approach will outpace the competition by 80% in the speed of new feature implementation. 80%, that is extraordinary. And I don't think I need to tell anybody that during COVID, speed and the speed at which you should be able to pivot and focus on improving your digital experience, that has been a differentiating factor throughout all of COVID. So that has been something that is going to be setting up enterprises for success in the long term. Uh, so especially if you are an enterprise who needs, who's facing strong competition in this new reality, being agile and composable is something that if you're listening to people like Gartner and McKinsey Corp, it's not just Dennis Augustine saying this, it's just um, some of the people who have studied uh, enterprise business for the longest time is saying you really do need to take a composable business and composable tech approach in order to be able to compete in the long haul and to be able to adapt rapidly now. So that is really the why of what you're doing. So we're talking about why, how, what it is, why we need to care about it. And finally, how do we get there? I like to have this 5P framework when I think about almost any problem in digital experience. Purpose, problem, people, processes, and then platform. And you'll notice that platform was the last thing that I said. So purpose, always start with why. And I'm gonna shout out Simon Sinek, uh, the author of this great book that I recommend for all of you. If you haven't read it, you should. It is called Start With Why. Uh, there's a quick follow-up to that called Find Your Why. Really great books for you in your personal life, but also great books for anybody in business. And it's the first thing that I did when I joined Conobos with Cam and Akshay was give them a, send them a copy of Start With Why so that we could be very much aligned on our why. Uh, it's important for you, and I'll say as well, I know this is a different part, of, it's not about the presentation, but to each of you personally, understanding your why is one of the most important things that you can do in your life. I'm not talking about your what, like, you know, not that I do software development, but why do you do it? And that's an important aspect of it. For me, my why is I think that I am a enabler of people towards good works. That's my why uh, in a nutshell. Um, that's why I think about people and business like systems. And my job is to put them together in a way uh, that helps us to achieve our collective purpose. So start with your why, purpose. When we're talking about digital experience, what are we trying to do? What is our company's mission? That's an important part of the conversation. And uh, that's not to be overlooked when you're talking about creating a digital experience program. Uh, and then what problem? are we faced with and what problem are we trying to solve for our customers? So what is our problem? What is our customer's problems? Two things that you need to consider and really be aligned on throughout your organization, uh, throughout your teams, all of your teams, your technical teams, your leadership teams, if everybody knows what the purpose and the problem is that we're working together towards is, we will be much more successful. And here comes the next one, people. It's often we wait too late to think about the people that are involved in an organization. If a business is a system, then the people are the lines of code and the groups of people are the modules that do the work. And so we've got to start with that purpose, identify the problem, then understand what we have in terms of the resources to work with, how the, how the system is put together. And then we talk about the processes that will enable the goals and, that we want to accomplish. OK, only then are we in a position to be able to understand what platform tools will fit the problem, fit the purpose, fit the people and the processes that we have in mind. And I think that there's all too often I've seen a lot of projects and digital initiatives go the other way around. Uh, first, it's like, hey, it's uh, we're going to use Sitecore and CDP and this and that. And that's, that's, that's our staff. Now, uh, what are we building? Well, and why? These are the, the questions are in the wrong order, right? We got to start at the top, purpose, problem, people, processes, and then platform. 
what does that mean in a practical way? I talk about, pur about purpose because you need to have um, a sense for where you're all rowing. You have to row in the same direction. And for that, you really need executive buy-in. I've been in far too many digital experience projects or in far too many digital experience transformations where there's been a lack of uh, executive leadership and executive presence. So I get into a room and it's the marketing people and the IT people, if I'm lucky, both will be there. Sometimes, most of the time it's one or the other, uh, that will be good. But very often it's not necessarily the, the higher up leadership. So I wanna see in the room when we have these conversations about purpose, the CEO, um, the C-suite should be there. The executive buy-in is so important when we start any of these digital initiatives so that we can be very clear on purpose and have that uh, transmitted in a compelling way. To get all of the people, the right people into the room, how do you get there? We need to have a cross-functional uh, team at the table. And I will correct my extra I in my spelling there. But um, a cross-functional team, I'm a big fan of centers of excellence, which means that you get folks from the executive suite leading that, you get folks from IT and from, and from uh, marketing and from any other stakeholders who might be even tangentially um, involved in leveraging some of those business capabilities at the same table. And you meet regularly to kind of have a check-in on your processes and so forth. Engage architects early. Oftentimes we are, as implementers, handed documents that went through, started off with marketing, calling a designer because they're gonna do their website over. Um, so it was like uh, marketing contacts some design firm, they do some pretty pictures. And then from there, when somebody comes up with some requirements based on that and says to the implementer, say, hey, go build this. Well, that's a little bit too late to call an architect. It's kind of as if you were building your dream house and you call the interior designer first, uh, instead of build calling you know, an architect who would understand the way you want to live, where you're building your house, how all the pieces fit together, call architects early. So call uh, customer experience architects, process engineers, enterprise solution architects very early on in the process. Again, all before you pick your platform tools. If we are taking a composable thinking, flexible thinking mindset, as, we, as Gartner said, is really critical principle towards composable business, we have to agree that we are in a test, measure, discover, and pivot sort of mode. So we have to agree on what the objectives KPIs are and then commit to being able to change. And then we have to be able to uh, accept an evolutionary mindset, knowing that we are going to check in on our center of excellence, check our KPIs and, and then change. And that also involves being able then to change the tools that you use and use them at the right time in your evolution. So when it comes to the people, here's something that I think that oftentimes the, this is the critical part. Right? And um, I think probably the, some of the, the greatest meat of a composable transition that we have to pay attention to. If you're going from a monolith all in one sort of approach to a truly composable uh, approach, you're going to be picking best of breed platform components Sure, but you're also going to need to understand that that means that you're going to have to accept that there'll be change in the way that people will work and what their job descriptions will be. And so I remember it was problems and so forth, people and process before we got the platform. When we do composable pivots, it means that people's jobs will change. So what sort of roles do I need to have a truly best of breed digital organization? I want folks to concentrate on areas where they can be truly excellent. And this is particularly important with large enterprises, uh, complex enterprises. So here's some typical roles, CX architects, enterprise solution architects, marketing strategists, content writers, UX specialists, data scientists, and so forth. All of those roles are, are really deep roles in an organization. And I think if you have an enterprise, you really need to focus on these. In some smaller organizations, you might find that, you know, the one or two people who are in the marketing department are 
content writer and they're also doing the page layouts and they're also analyzing the data and um, they're setting up the you know the marketing um, strategy and so forth and this multiple they're wearing multiple hats it's hard to avoid that in many respects but if we want to be a truly agile composable business best of breed also applies to your people and think about this though if you are a marketing specialist who has been previously having to write content and do layouts and do SEO and do the analytics and so forth. What a relief it might be if you could just focus on being excellent at content or excellent at UX or excellent at data analysis. And I think that that is really um, an important thing to understand when we have specialists, they become best of breed in their work. They have single areas of responsibility. They have things that they need in and out in terms of interfaces and contracts with other people. And that will yield, if Gartner's right, a much more agile, nimble team. So we have to start with making our teams agile and nimble and think right now, if you are in a monolithic situation with your team, how do I start to break up the monolithic team and roles so that I'm empower people to specialize in the things that they are excellent at? or bring on people who are excellent at these specific roles that I need to be a more composable business. So uh, when, you, when you're working on your processes, uh, this is gonna be the most important thing as you're working with your, with your people to align your processes with these best of breed sort of single areas of responsibilities. Think about the functions that each person is going to have to serve, what inputs and outputs will they need, you know what, if somebody is doing UX, what will they need? They'll need, they'll need to have an idea as to the customer personas. And so they'll need inputs from the marketing um, or the, from the strategists on there. Uh, if somebody's doing personalization, maybe they're gonna need some inputs and, and information from the data analysts on, on the other front. Uh, so think about their inputs and outputs. What will they require? Analyze your processes. I was at one customer, actually the one I talked about Content Hub before where it took them previously something like 14 days to get a piece of content all the way from uh, ideation to being published on their website. And it's not very agile. And we worked with them, identified certain bottlenecks and thought things like, you know, asset management was a bottleneck. Um, having a centralized place to deal with content was a bottleneck. And when we eliminated the particular bottlenecks in the processes, then we were able to pick platform tools to address those bottlenecks. In this case, it was Content Hub that was the appropriate tool for that particular problem. But start with the bottlenecks and the processes before you pick those tools. And then eliminate and check for errors in that, much like you would in any sort of software system. I think that that's gone backwards, is it? There we go. If you're then changing how your team is structured, the platform to the processes that you'll observe, the platform tools that you'll be using. I want to uh, call out uh, Irina uh, Gaseva's uh, sage words here. I said about a month or two back, um, Gartner analyst uh, Irina here said, moving from monolith to composable is a journey. It starts with composable business and composable thinking before the industry can move to composable DXP. That is so wise. So if you're thinking about a pivot towards composable, pay really good attention to the whole business aspect before you make those platform choices. If you are going to just rip out everything and build something new, um, you go into your bat cave for six, nine, eight, ten months, a year, and, uh, and build a whole new thing, that's a revolution. And revolutions have martyrs, and you don't want your team or yourself to be that. What you want to do is to slowly change the roles, slowly change the processes, and then slowly align the tools that are best of breed for the, for, for the processes that you will put in place. Okay, so don't think about pivoting wholesale all in one step. I think that's a recipe for disaster. Uh, rather, uh, Start slowly, start in bite-sized pieces and evolve rather than uh, having a revolution in your organization. Is composability for everyone, for every organization? I think the simple answer is no. 
no, 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 no. And when may it not be the best uh, approach for an organization? If you're a small enterprise who really needs to have generalists because you really only have a one or two person marketing team or IT team, perhaps an all-in-one, and perhaps a simpler all-in-one might be the, the, the tool for you. Uh, if you're a siloed organization, if you are an organization that is not able to give people the autonomy that they may need to do UX over here and content over here and analytics on the other side, well, perhaps a composable approach is not necessarily well suited to your organization. But when it is a great fit is certainly, and I think necessary at enterprise scale. So mid large enterprise where we are able to have specialists, where we're able to have a team that's robust enough so people can be best of breed in their role. When you have an engaged C-suite who is really to helping to steer the ship. If you have a composable digital experience program with all of these various bits, with all of these people who have their autonomy and your C-suite is not engaged in leadership, that will, is a recipe for disaster. So you need to have that engaged C-suite if you're gonna be successful in having a composable pivot. And you have to be willing to share uh, control and to work well with others. So if that's your organization or if you're willing to make that the nature of your organization, then you might that might be a good fit for for you. And that is the the meat of uh, the the presentation that I have here today. We'll we'll pause for some questions and comments uh, a little bit after if there are any. You can uh, reach me on Twitter at uh, Psychor Dennis on Twitter, uh, Dennis Augustine on on LinkedIn. I want to as well uh, encourage you to uh, join us when you can for the Sitecore Strategy Lunch. We are working on setting up a couple things. Uh, I, we're hoping that the next one will center around Sitecore CDP and personalize and get a marketing perspective on when those tools are appropriate, exactly what roles do they, do they fill uh, in, in, your, in your stack. So look out for that coming very soon. Again, so the Sitecore Strategy Lunch, if you want to Take a quick scan of that or just to look us up on Meetup. Psych, so that's the North America Psychor Strategy Lunch. I hope there's going to be some others coming in other parts of the world soon. But that is there. I hope to see you there. I see Bala there from time to time. So much. Thank you for coming, Bala, all the time. And this, uh, again, something that I from time to time see Bala and others on is the uh, DX Cafe. So the DX Cafe is a community that um, we're sponsoring over at Konobos, but uh, it's a community that's open to anybody who is in the digital experience space. So whether you are a marketer or a technologist, um, sign up for the DX Cafe. We had, we've been having some great sessions. I kicked it off and then we brought in the heavyweights and Dean Barker from Optimizely was one of our guests uh, most lately very engaging person who has a slightly different take on the composable picture. Uh, next week, we will be having uh, Santa from Concia over there. Again, a, a vendor in our composable DXP space who is uh, going to have some great things to share about experience orchestration and personalization and where that fits into the composable picture as well. So the DX Cafe, please, uh, you can uh, go to the the URL there or scan that link to, to sign up for the DX Cafe. You'll also note that if there's a Toastmasters club, which is part of the DX Cafe, where you can come and practice your public speaking and leadership skills. Toastmasters is the world's largest and probably the best value in terms of leadership training and public speaking skills training of anywhere in the world. So join us for that. Uh, there can be more information there if you just scan that and go to that URL. You can get some more info on joining us for the DX Cafe. And with that, I will conclude. I'm going to stop sharing the screen right now. And that, uh, folks, is, is the presentation so far. And um, if you have any questions or comments, I, I, I am... I am uh, envious to hear them. 
But as well, I'd be, I would love to hear from any of the folks here uh, who are now working with organizations who might be undergoing a sort of composable headless pivot. Is there anybody on the, on the call here who has, has a customer who is adopting some of the newer composable stack that we're dealing with? And I wonder what your experience is. Four questions or comments. Rich, did you take yourself off mute for for a purpose, or you just? Uh... I was, I was, I, I, I did not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, 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 I did just want to share a thought, and and it's not a direct question. I'm still, I'm still trying to get my thoughts together. Anyway, I really enjoyed your your presentation, Eric. It was, it was really good. Um, I'm trying to fit it into you know some of the challenges that that we have now being on, on Sitecore, you know XP, um, and and we were sort of, I guess you could call composable you know, semi-composable before, you know, or currently as, as, as we integrate with, with a lot of other systems such as Salesforce and, and things like that, you know, but, you know, so some, some of the challenges that, that, that I'm looking at now is, you know, with XP, we had you know, the personalization, every, everything was sort of tightly coupled in, in that one platform, you know, now, now we're looking at, you know, just like XM, Sitecore, maybe Sitecore personalized, but you know what, we have, we have Salesforce and, and, and we also have Interaction Studio with Salesforce, right? Yeah. And and so we have you know other vendors working with that. Um, and you know I am unable to go to anyone and say, hey, what's the gap analysis I have here with with Sitecore personalized and Salesforce Interaction Studio per se, right? right. And and right. The, the, the find a specialist that 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 can answer all my questions based on both platforms is, you know, pretty, pretty impossible at this point, yeah. you know? Yeah. So, so it, as far as like composable, it was like, I totally get it. I totally understand it. But now I sort of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm thrown out in the wild now because there, there's these other decisions. And, and, and like you said, you know, it takes time and stuff and, 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 and <laughs> you know, our, our, our leadership and stuff doesn't always appreciate, you know, how long it takes to get things done, you know, and, and, right. and so I, those are just a couple comments on top of my head. I, you know, I want to throw out towards sure. you and maybe, maybe get your thoughts on that and stuff, but that was, that was just an example, you know, so, mm -hmm. and, and, and throw another one out there, like, like using XP, like we don't use analytics. We, we use GA for that kind of stuff. Um, right. I think that's sort of right. a given um, the, the, the email portion, email marketing, you know, that that's on the Salesforce side and, and, and things like that. But what, it, what does composable you know, model is bringing up is like, well, you know, what, what, and I don't want to get, you know, too tied down with software pretty much, you know, but we, we do want to choose, you know, the best, you know, platforms per that, like, like in your presentation, you know, the best of the breed and stuff. It, mm -hmm. That's what I'm struggling with is, is trying to find out what, what exactly that is, you know, yeah, uh, the, the, those gap analysis stuff between, between softwares and stuff. It just sort of sure. opened up a, whole new world and ball is probably sick of me talking about it right ball <laughs> like, <laughs> like I, I i get my frustration for ball all the time <laughs> right, right. Um, um, well ball sorry <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're good. there's a lot going Man, on i don't know if any of that made sense to you or, or no i did totally totally did totally did it, it's sorry Bella, you were saying no, no, no. I said, Dennis, this is a lot of things going on. It's been there for a long time, but now it's more like the bus in town. Kind of like everybody started yes. this headless and yeah. Couple. Yeah. I, I, I want to, I want to say, uh, um, I think, I, so I've, I've heard this comment uh, from, from folks a few times that, you know, hey, weren't we always doing composable? Right. Uh, in one way. And I think we think about that more as software architects because we know you know this system does that this other system does that and we can see in our heads you know the system architecture diagram right where, our, where salesforce is doing this thing and it's integrated with that and this is the api etc yep. right so that's i think that's why we we think about it this way when gartner was talking about composability though like in its true sense i mean sure a well architected software system is composable okay i'll i'll give you that Okay, that is not what we're talking about. I just want to say that again. That's not what we're talking about. So this, this idea that because I was doing integrations and I happen to have Salesforce connected to this or that, it's composable or always has been, is not what 
Gartner was talking about. And the reason why I know that it's not what it was talking about, and the reason why I know that's not the thing, Gartner was talking about composability because composability led to greater business agility and ability to pivot, right? And I've been on enough Sitecore projects that have been integrated with SAP and Salesforce and, 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 that have taken way too long um, in the past that I know that that was not business agility. So something was right, right there was not um, lending itself well to what Gartner was really mentioning. And I think that maybe if we talk about, uh, Rich, when you talked about your, um, that whole, you know, you know, do I use CDP? Well, we have Salesforce. Um, where, what tool do we use? Uh, that's why I love to use this 5P approach. And I want to take it back up a, quest, uh, a, a notch and say, okay, let's stop talking about the platform right now. Forget the platform. Let's go up one to processes and people. Let's go up two to processes and people. And let's forget about that's, that that stuff exists, right? We're going to pick the platform next. Let's have a look at what is the ideal place in your organization? Who, what, who, is, who are the people that are going to do the personalization, that should be doing the personalization, right? Who are the ones who are best suited um, in their knowledge of the customer, the data, et cetera, to do that job? And where are they in the process? Are they closer to where then, if we're talking about the, what platform do I give them, are they closer to where Salesforce lives? Or are they closer to where CDP lives? Or, C, you know what I mean? So where are they in those processes? That's the thing that I think we need to, when we get to be composable business, we're thinking about how do I make my process and my people and my business much more agile before I talk about platform tools, right? And what I might find is, and best of breed is part of that in terms of the people and processes too. So what I, you know, when I think about then um, competencies like user experience as a competency that we need to be excellent at to compete in a business, I understand that I don't need to have that in my all-in-one DXP. And maybe I should be talking about how does that UX specialist like to work what do they work with today? And therefore, where does the page orchestration of my web experience really belong? What tools do I need to give them, right? Uh, what fits that purpose? And then that becomes a little bit of an easier choice. You might find in your organization that you know, it is the customer service team that for whatever use case, or the sales team that might have to have some sort of aspect of the, or somebody who's interfacing maybe with both, who has to have, an, who has to have their hands on the personalization aspect of that, of that thing. Um, and then perhaps the, the tool where you'll do that will become more evident to you. I will say that the, the answer is not the same for every organization. So I can't say that the best tool to use for personalization is Cycler Personalized or Optimizely or whatever it is. We want to talk first about what the processes and the people are that fit the particular situation. I know that's not an answer for how you get there specifically in your situation, Rich, but um, I think if you want to take it back up a step to just talk about, well, you know, a little bit of process analysis and who's the people involved, what skill set do they have, and how do we transition their jobs, um, you know, this next quarter um, in one step then, you know, maybe it, it, it makes the choices a little bit more clear um, in that way. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yep. Yep. Whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I know it, it's not, it's not, it's, there's no, the, the, the short answer is there's, there's no easy answer to uh, what yeah, tool I, I, you I, pick I, for I, what, for what, for what, what you, tool do you pick for what situation or how do you make the transition? But if you're going to make the transition, it does have to start with the transition of people's job function. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then after job function, um, it is what, what, what tools do I need to do that job function in my organization? And you might find that, you know, a lot of that belongs in Salesforce and you need to plug into Salesforce, or you might find that it belongs in the marketing team and CDP or personalize and plug it in there. But yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. All right, where are we? Where are we at with uh, time? Questions? Any other comments? Uh, questions? What are you up to, Bala? You guys doing any composable 
changes these days? Yeah, one of them which gave an update. <laughs> so okay, <laughs> right on. Uh, the other uh, one I'm currently working on is more related to Auto Cloud, and uh, it's an Excel. Uh, mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, I don't know, but I would say Kobe for search. Um, and eventually pick up uh, something related to personalize uh, mm. or CDP. I don't know what their choice would be, but um, they do also have some integration with HubSpot. So for hey. the marketing stuff. That's interesting to me. So like when you're talking about this one where they're bringing in, for example, um, Order Cloud, right? Who's, who's going to be using Order Cloud in the organization? It's an e-commerce platform. So they are building a store that they want the order cloud to be the e-commerce platform that they are relying on. Yeah, but I mean, like who in the organization, organization. or role or role or role wise will be using order cloud? Like you mean, like who's making this choice? No, I mean, like who's actually like working with order cloud every day? What department okay, are, the they, person are they in? Be, so this is going to be. Uh, uh, people who are going to manage the store, uh, basically the store admin, you, you can name it that way. But uh, the inputs are going to be, so in this case, there is a catalog team which does all the catalog management. And there is a team from the finance who decides what cost they are going to sell it. So this person or the role, who they, they are just building this team right now, but there are like multiple teams involved to make this happen. Um, but this imaginary team is going to handle uh, what the catalog items are going to be. They need to add that to the catalog and also get the pricing information from the finance team to do that. And also they are going to have a customer success team or more like the customer support, which also need to support when customers are having trouble with their orders and right. returns and things like that. What you do in Amazon day to day, they, they, they just have to deal with all the things. Yeah. And, you know, it, it makes me it makes me wonder, and I don't know the answer to this either, right? But, you know, like it sounds like there's, you know, this catalog team and this other team and this other team who's like taking all of that stuff and kind of passing this information to this person or role that will be then using order cloud, right? Correct. And, and it, it does make me wonder if um, from if I'm switching the script to think about the people and business as a as the composable elements first i wonder if not the catalog team should just start me managing a catalog i mean that's a question i don't know the answer if that's true like whether or not they should be like right in there or if the people who deal with pricing should have their own process and be right in there so that you know the pricing can change without somebody passing a message you're to absolutely right so that is the end goal uh, but for the mvp we are just getting this into one system Okay. I see where you're asking the question is like, yes, if this person is working out of um, dynamic CRM where they maintain all the customer, then they should be just there. Like, why should I learn this new tool? I don't have to do, do anything there. From the pricing aspect, yes. So all these different integration points, yes. Um, the answer is yes, but eventually. But for the MVP, this is like one point, like we just have to get this rolling and moving on. Yeah. But eventually when the integration happens, uh, in this case, the catalog management team have their own tool that's internal. And that tool will be di directly wired up or with, through a sync process that goes back to order cloud. So they really don't have to get into order cloud, do anything there. They just sit in their tool. They just hand the items there and they're like, it gets published everywhere where it needs to go. Right. And yeah. from the finance aspect of it, although things are being managed in order cloud, everything is already wired back to their dynamic CRM in this case. Dynamics, 3, Dynamics 365 or the Microsoft Dynamics is what they are using. So everything goes back to that system. So the finance in finance team, if they want to check a payment or do a refund, everything, they don't really get into this order cloud platform. They just do it in their system. We have web hooks that comes back to our system and we do it. So certain systems we are already hooked up. So we really don't have, they don't have to come into this. But uh, to the answer, uh, this system is somebody like that's a new team that's going to do it. Initially, mm -hmm. they're going to be some manual effort of talking to this catalogs team or a finance team and things. Yeah. But eventually, the pricing information comes from Dynamics. And then the catalog information comes from the catalog team. It's all like synced up into this system. And then it's all plugged in. 
and for okay. the marketing segmentation and a lot of other things hubspot is being involved like you said in this case they already have a subscription so we don't have to reinvent the wheel and say hey you need to buy sales force because this is having on all those things so we are just saying like what do you have so you have hubspot okay let's use that we don't want you to just go buy some other platform to do the email marketing for you yeah so not use the existing ones that your organization is comfortable using already your messaging or like your communication teams it's already our if they are and they're using it so why bring in a new tool so right. from my aspect i recommended like okay whatever you have i'm happy to support that not saying like just go buy this new stuff and then let's do with it yeah yeah i got you i got you but i and- think a lot of cases when people walk in or the groups which are comfortable with certain things i would go in and say like being more advocacy of sitecore and i was like oh probably you should get sitecore send and get sitecore cdp and personalize and let's do it this way i don't want to upsell that rather i said like what do you have i don't want you to spend more money let's pick what you have and then do that so yeah absolutely and i like i i i told totally that's the right approach i mean first of all yeah start with where where they're at but i also think like your your end goal yeah your end goal where the folks who are doing catalogs are focusing on catalogs and the place where they're they they they're, they're used to working mm-hmm. that's just that's just going that is in terms of the people and process more single area of responsibility and more loosely coupled in that way you do the you did the integration to enable the loose coupling of the the team into the right. process right so yep. that's i i think that that then so you see how then like thinking about how the team can be more efficient to 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 unbottleneck the process then makes the whole system including the platform and the people a more agile business a more composable business in that approach in your end game like when you talk about the intermediary step where you're bringing everything into this one person or this one team who's aggregating everything mm-hmm. that's kind of a little bit more of a bottleneck um prone situation so one thing also is like we are just having a uh that is also not a manual process so all this data is curated in their catalogs and we're just taking an export out of it and importing it here for now to just get it rolling yeah. because they didn't have enough time so that's just a temporary solution but eventually it should be all like when they do the updates and everything is all wired and it should be all in sync that's the end goal yeah right on well that end goal does sound a lot more aligned with how you need to go in my mind to to keep the business units as much in control to give them as much autonomy as much loosely coupledness into the process as you can so there's a fewer bottlenecks and that i think is that that does sound to me like a much more uh, kind of composable truly composable approach um than yeah that the then intermediate step for sure absolutely thank you for the feedback <laughs> <laughs> well i'm sure you knew that because that's what you're planning on doing so you you already had it well, you know, i'm just learning my way but i think uh, yeah like you said just learning stuff here and we it. all are we all are this is like i said this was 2019 gartner started talking about this thing and it's now the cool thing on the block and we all have to figure how we make it real but i do i do think it's also it's it's just always important to remember that um the whole point is to make the the people and processes way more agile and we should think less about the technical pieces and think about them sec- as a secondary thing that will really help to to guide us yeah. uh any like couple of minutes here like any further final questions i know i am you want to add anything mato yeah i have a quick question on that so yeah this is a great discussion so the the loosely coupled processes you know when we talk to businesses about these kind of loosely coupled processes um i know there are a lot of tools involved in the future when we solution those processes uh but the challenge i'm thinking you know to make it loosely coupled businesses would it involve a lot of people to manage all those processes as well as you know make them skillful to understand those processes at different places right so i mean do we need to train them you know at different places ha <laughs> it's going to be a hard challenge for the skill set process you know dividing them into multiple different processes you know as the in the composable way rather yeah. compared to the monolith world one yeah. to one 
sharp, right? Like yeah. we often run into this kind of reusability in our XP world too, right? When you talk to project mm-hmm. authors, sometimes you just create the whole page into one template and all the fields exist in the one template. Yeah. But that's the reusability that you create a different components, you know, for the, the bits and pieces on the pages. So you often run into this kind of conversation with the business. And I feel like the biggest challenge for us is to make the business understand what is this loosely coupled you know, process look like and then make them skillful. Is yeah. that the right approach? Yeah, I think I think there's you you brought up like the it's a so um, loosely coupled uh, ness <laughs> is a double edged sword. I you know we all from the all of us who are psychor technologists too have known about Helix, right? And um, you know that was part of the pros, part of why we did Helix, just to make sure that there was that separation of concerns, that there was not there was the loose coupledness. And I've seen stuff where we've had Helix implementations where um, I've seen I've seen Helix implementations where the, the you know like there has been just the right amount and it is very flexible. And I've seen Helix implementations where there's like you know um, too much kind of um, it's too granular. And you get open a project and there's like, you know, open a solution and there's like, I, I, and, and Cam will, if, if he watches this in replay, he will know who I'm talking about. But we have uh, I've come across a solution that had something like, I don't know, I want to say it was over 150, maybe close pushing 200 projects in the one solution. And that was like Uber Helix. And in, in, an, in an attempt to make, in an attempt to make it, granular so granular that it would be loose very loosely coupled it became a monstrosity that defeated the purpose right there was just too much there and you can do the same thing with people's roles right you can there is the right amount of segregation of the roles and it really will depend on the team and the resources that you have so maybe on and and maybe even just the where you are in that evolution you know maybe today you just want to separate out Maybe you want to create something where, you know, the UX and personalization um, uh, part of it happens on one with, 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 with you know, uh, or lumped in or clumped in with, with, with one person and one set of processes while perhaps the content part is lumped in with another uh, part of processes and people. So it's going to really depend on making, get, finding that right balance, uh, Binu. I think you don't, you, there is a danger in being uh, too granular in the roles and especially sometimes an organization can't afford all of those people today and there is the training overhead and you want to think about yeah again the people first and the processes first and what is your training plan and how many what sort of skill sets do they need to learn today to be useful in what i'm planning out for sure so there's yeah definitely you want to you want to have that right mix of of um how granular do you want to make those those roles xena's popped in to to say hello Actually, my supervisor <laughs> there she is. and I see more opportunity for the strategy MVPs um, than the technology MVPs you know in that source <laughs> well I think um, I think we got I think there's a race to the middle um, happening right now so if all of you who are listening who are especially as we get closer to this future SaaS um, sort of world with our with the Psychor products and other composable sort of products, you're going to have less, less, uh, fewer technical challenges, hopefully, like development things to do, and more orchestration and connecting things to do, which means I think that the skill set needs to start to transition. So if you're a technologist or a software developer architect today, start to think more about the strategic elements, because you're going to be more useful in this next phase. If you're a strategists uh, today start thinking a little bit more about how some of the pieces fit together technically because I think that the high value roles of the future in especially in our site core space are once more of a hybrid sort of type of thing I know that goes against the single area of responsibility kind of thing we're talking about but I think that you know we're talking about I think CX architecture uh, enterprise architecture roles have a lot of overlap and that is where some of the highest value is going to be. Yes, we'll still need 
you know, .NET developers to do Azure functions. And yes, people will need to know React and, and Next.js and to do the front end and stuff. But those will become more and more commoditized. And the really higher value roles will be ones that folks who can bridge the gap to understand both sides of this composable picture. Absolutely. Can't agree more. Thank you.